I immediately tried to call my daughter's phone, and it went straight to voicemail. So I said, well, let me try texting her. So I tried texting her, and I didn't get any response. It was about 10, 10.30 that night when we just finally got the confirmation that we had indeed lost her in that shooting. So, yeah. And I will say that's the worst day of my life. The next day, starting at 7 o'clock in the morning, friends started pouring in. And um, we had people, people in the home to support us and encourage us from morning to night. And it meant so much. It helped us to focus on something else at the time. The love that they showed to us, it was just astounding. It was just so amazing. And that's what helped us to get through, to get through it all. It was our family, our spiritual family. The city of Virginia Beach, they volunteered to take care of all of the victims' arrangements. And because of that amount of people, the venue that they decided upon, it was the Opera House in Norfolk. The brothers, they got everything together. The city didn't really have to do anything. They just gave us the, the venue. And what really impressed them the city was that the whole memorial, everything took place within an hour. The city officials were there in attendance. You had the local newspapers who covered it, reporters. The reporters were persistent in wanting to, to talk, to talk. And so Actually, two of my brothers, they, they handled all of that information with the guidance from those two brothers who came down. It kept us from having to even worry about that, you know. So it was very helpful. So we're hearing here from a lady called DeGenario about her heartbreaking story, Any Parent's Worst Nightmare, of losing her daughter, Laquita Brown. I cannot help but sympathise with this poor woman. Again, it's the worst nightmare of any parent to outlive your child, to have to attend your own child's funeral. So hearing her recount this ordeal, which happened completely out of the blue, apparently as the result of a shooting... It's, it's, again, heartbreaking, and I really do feel for this lady. But again, it feels like there's definitely an exploitative element to this story and the way it's being told. We're not hearing anything unique about Jehovah's Witnesses in terms of their claims to being God's one and only true organisation, of course, when there is a tragedy in almost any faith community, that community is going to rally round and try to offer support and condolences to the person who has lost someone, to the bereaved. I just cannot see how Jehovah's Witnesses are in any way unique in doing this. And in fact, again, as heartbreaking as this story is, it raises questions. It gives us an insight into how insular and self-interested the Jehovah's Witness religion is, because nowhere in this segment, and I don't blame DeGenerio for this, by the way, 
obviously her words, her interview has been edited. And it can't have been, I don't like to think that it was her decision. But we're not hearing the names of the other victims. We're hearing that there were other victims. We're hearing that the gunman opened fire on employees at the time Laquita died. But it's only when we dig into this story that we find out who these victims were. In fact, when this happened, according to this CNN article, there were 12 victims in total killed in the attack. It would have been nice to have a list of the names, don't you think? Some acknowledgement of the loss of life during this atrocity. If JW Broadcasting doesn't want to do it, I'm happy to do it in this rebuttal. But I don't think it should have fallen to me to list these names. Richard H. Nettleton, who was the gunman's boss... Herbert Snelling, Laquita C. Brown, Mary Louise Gale, Alexander Mikhail Gusev, Tara Welch Gallagher, Christopher Kelly Rapp, Joshua O. Hardy, Ryan Keith Cox, Michelle Langer, and Robert Williams. Those were among the 12 who died on that terrible day. Again, why the focus just on Jehovah's Witnesses? It seems to be, as far as I can see, taking a tragedy and making that tragedy all about the religion. All about an organisation that supposedly swept in and helped everything go smoothly. And in what way did they specifically do that? The reporters were persistent in wanting to, to talk, to talk. And so, actually two of my brothers, they, they handled all of that information with the guidance from those two brothers who came down. It kept us from having to even worry about that. So in terms of congratulating themselves for their handling of this tragedy, one of the main ways, apparently, that they helped the victim's family was to deal with the media. Apparently, branch representatives came and gave guidance for the persistent reporters and their questions. I don't know. Again, it sounds very much like this is a case of an organisation that cares very much about its image. And when tragedy strikes, it's not necessarily just about helping the bereaved, helping the victim's family. It's about managing the situation from a PR standpoint and making sure that persistent reporters get the right message. Maybe that is what De Janeiro wanted in that situation. Again, she must have been going through hell when this happened, and maybe speaking to reporters was the absolute last thing she wanted to do. But to what extent was that even a choice for her? I think that when something like that happens, you want people to be remembered by those who cared most about them. And again, even though perhaps she didn't want to speak to reporters, it would have been terrible if she were denied a voice at that time because men in suits from Bethel came barreling in and said, we're going to handle this. It would be sad if De Janeiro did have something to say but felt sidelined in that situation. Going through this, I could really feel Jehovah's hand. It's as if he was rubbing my shoulders and saying, it's going to be all right. You'll be all right. I'm going to get you through this. And he has. 
each day he gets me through this. If it can happen to someone else, it can happen to me. And in this instance, it did. But that helps me to keep a perspective. And I reflect on how Jehovah is going to reverse it. That's my biggest hope, is to see Jehovah reverse the damage that has been done. He's promised it, and my faith is in the fulfillment of his promises. So I look forward to being reunited with my daughter. And that right there at the end was, for me, the most heartbreaking part of the story, to see the full extent to which this poor woman is being exploited by the religion that's using her grief and trauma for propaganda. It's not just that this woman has gone through this unthinkable ordeal of outliving her child, of having to bury her child. She's also having that grief leveraged for propaganda value, and she's being lied to about her expectations. She's being given these completely unfounded and unreasonable expectations that she is going to be reunited with her daughter, that Jehovah is going to undo all of the damage that was done. Those were roughly her words. And all of this is based on false promises in an organization that has been lying to people for decades and promising people for decades that they will be reunited with their loved ones imminently. So not just in the distant future, this poor woman believes that she's going to be reunited with her daughter very, very soon because Armageddon's just around the corner and the logic that's given to Jehovah's Witnesses is that almost certainly those who died closer to Armageddon will be among the first ones to be resurrected. That's what you're told as a Jehovah's Witness. So just heartbreaking to see not just the way this woman is being used as a puppet to indoctrinate more and more people, but also the way she's being put in a state of denial. She's not able to properly grieve the loss of her daughter because a cult is using this tragedy as leverage to control her. Mm -hmm.